This talk is brought to you by the Thomistic Institute. For more talks like this, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. The Mind of Christ, Aquinas and the Fathers, on Christ's Human Knowledge and Our Salvation. Did Jesus know he was God? During his earthly life, did he see the Father's face? Or as the medieval tradition says, did he have the beatific vision with his human mind? Was he also filled with prophetic knowledge? Did he advance in acquired knowledge through his human experiences? St. Thomas Aquinas answers yes to all of these questions. And he holds that saying so is foundational for the Christian profession of faith. So St. Thomas's account of Christ's human knowledge was extremely influential. And by the Baroque period, his view that Jesus had three types of human knowledge, beatific vision, infused prophetic knowledge, and acquired or experiential human knowledge, the average knowledge that all of us acquire through our senses. Aquinas' view that Jesus had these three types of human knowledge in his human mind had become nearly universally accepted by Catholic theologians. But in the late 19th century, Protestant theologians of canonic Christology began to theorize in a very different vein. And by the middle of the 20th century, many Catholic scholars, including both exegetes and dogmaticians, also began to disagree with Aquinas on this point, and especially on the point that Jesus had the beatific vision during his earthly life as man in his human mind. And similarly, many have also expressed doubt over Aquinas' argument that Jesus would have had a plenary or full, absolutely full, supernatural, infused, prophetic knowledge in his human mind. Now, often the objection is that Aquinas portrays Jesus with an unrealistic or even inhuman knowledge during his earthly life. And critics see it as the application of what they sometimes call the principle of perfection. So according to them, this principle of perfection goes like this. It's a presupposition that Christ's humanity must have the absolutely best of everything. So for many contemporary theologians and exegetes, it's important that Jesus not have the best of everything or the beatific vision or even a supreme prophetic illumination of his human man mind. They want to say that he lives his life in the obscurity of faith and that he only discovers, at least some hold this, that he only discovers his, di his divine identity and his saving mission through time during the course of his earthly life. Some even think that as Jesus died on the cross, he suffered from a profound interior darkness bordering on despair, but that he remained steadfast in his faith and self-abandonment, confident that the Father would vindicate him in the end. In recent years, a number of scholars have defended Aquinas' traditional position that Jesus had the vision of the Father's face, the beatific vision, and also infused supernatural life during his human life. And I agree with many of their arguments, but that's well-worn ground. And so I'd like to step back and take a wider angle view of the question. So my claim today is that Aquinas's view on Christ's human knowledge is a more refined and elaborated version of the orthodox pro-Nicene theological trajectory that developed in the patristic age. And it developed not from philosophical speculation or from a principle of perfection uh, formed in a kind of naive way, but it, that it emerges from a theological exegesis of sacred scripture. During the course of his career as a theologian, Aquinas deepened and developed this synthesis of the church fathers as he gained access to the great Christological councils and more of the texts of the church fathers, which he did uh, as he worked in the middle of his career. So Aquinas sees this claim about Jesus' human knowledge as one important facet of a larger account of how we are saved 
by way of the knowledge of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit brought to us by the incarnate word. So my talk today, that's the introduction. My talk is going to have two parts. Part one summarizes the church fathers on Christ's knowledge in relation to our salvation. We could start with the Arian controversy and a longer version of this paper dealt with that and St. Athanasius, but we're going to jump uh, ahead to the controversy over Apollinarius and up through the Third Council of Constantinople. And then part two of my talk outlines three overarching arguments from Aquinas that frame his case for Christ's supreme supernatural human knowledge in the mind of Jesus, showing why Jesus having these three kinds of knowledge is so important. In fact, Aquinas thinks they're necessary to affirm. Okay, so part one, the patristic heritage. With the notable exception of St. Augustine and St. Fulgentius of Ruspe, the church fathers generally do not address whether Jesus had the beatific vision. In fact, beatific vision is not even yet a category for thinking about Christ's knowledge. But if we look more broadly at the place of Christ's knowledge in the plan of salvation in the church fathers, we discover a rich patristic teaching forged through a series of major controversies. So viewed in retrospect, we can discern in the orthodox pro-Nicene position a discernible trajectory of development that yielded an increasingly clear teaching on the plenary or full supernatural knowledge possessed by Christ in his human mind. Aquinas came into contact with this patristic heritage and he mines it. He mines this rich source material to produce an even more elaborated or well-developed synthesis dealing with the supernatural human knowledge of Jesus. So we could say a lot about St. Athanasius and the immediate response to the Arian crisis. But in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over that part and move directly to a controversy that gives us more traction on this question. It's the controversy over the teaching of Apollinarius of Laodicea from the 360s. So Apollinarius claimed that the Logos took the place of the rational mind in Jesus, and therefore he denied that Christ has a human created mind. St. Gregory of Nazianzus countered this heretical teaching, arguing that Christ does have a human mind and that we're saved precisely through this human mind of Christ. So the word came to his own image and, quote, bore flesh for the sake of flesh and mingled with a rational soul for my soul's sake, holy cleansing, like by like. As Gregory puts it in his famous letter 101 to Cladonius, and Aquinas knew at least fragments of this text uh, and knew more of it through John Damascene's paraphrase, and this is text A on your handout. Gregory writes, quote, whoever has set his hope on a human being without mind is actually mindless himself and unworthy of being saved in his entirety. The unassumed is the unhealed, but what is united with God is also being saved. And Gregory goes on, mind mingles with mind, closer to Godhead as it is and more familiar through it meditating, med excuse me, mediating between Godhead and the grossness of flesh. The very thing that needed salvation was assumed. Therefore, mind was assumed. So the logic of Gregory's position is that man's mind fell into disorder through sin. And so man's mind especially needed to be healed, raised up, illuminated with the knowledge of God in the word's incarnation. So he thinks it's especially important to say that Jesus had a human mind and that our salvation in a certain way is coming through that human mind being assumed by the word of God. In the same period, we find an impressive list of church fathers 
who reject the claim that Jesus was ignorant of the day of judgment. This was a big controversy, something that a lot of people talked about. So, for example, St. Ambrose underlines that Christ knows the Father whom he reveals, has lordship over the Sabbath as son of man, and is vested with plenary judiciary power. In his Catena Aurea, Aquinas also quotes other patristic texts along the same lines, citing Hilary of Poitiers and St. Jerome. St. Cyril of Alexandria says much the same thing, as does St. John Chrysostom, whom Aquinas also quotes on this point in the Summa Theologiae. So Aquinas was aware of these patristic views. Notable among the church fathers, St. Augustine seems to have gone even further than the ones I've just mentioned, implying, as uh, Father Simon Gain has argued in a recent book, implying in two of his texts that Jesus as man saw the Father, producing the kind of perfect human knowledge otherwise reserved for the blessed in heaven. So in other words, Father Gain argues that Augustine actually does explicitly hold for Jesus having what we would call the beatific vision, even though he doesn't use that label for it. Augustine doesn't. We can move forward in the patristic controversies. The fifth century debates over Nestorianism and Monophysitism brought further theological clarifications that are important for us. While the human knowledge of Christ wasn't directly implicated in those controversies, their results became the fundamental framework for later reflection that is important for our subject. So the Council of Ephesus, in condemning Nestorius, affirmed that there is only one person in Christ, that's the divine word, who is the subject of all that we say about him. And the Council of Chalcedon likewise rejected monophysitism, which is the view that Jesus has a single nature after the union between God and man. So uh, next, I would point you to text B, which is from the Council of Chalcedon on the handout. I'm not going to read that uh, for you, but you can see that uh, it's holding for one person, two natures, without division, without confusion or change, without separation. The natures remain distinct while being united to each other. In the words of Pope Leo the Great's famous letter to Flavian, which was quoted by the Council of Chalcedon, and this isn't on your handout, uh, but I'll quote it for you. Quote, the true God was born in the complete and perfect nature of true man, complete in his nature and complete in ours. Each nature does what is proper to each in communion with the other, end quote. So the principle of perfection, that Jesus has a perfect human nature, makes a notable appearance here along with the fundamental affirmation that the properties of the divine nature are not to be confused with the properties of the human. For subsequent church fathers who desire to be loyal to Ephesus and Chalcedon, these councils call them to affirm that there is one subject in Christ, that's the divine word, who knows according to or knows in his two distinct natures. That means that divine knowledge cannot simply be ascribed to Jesus' human mind without some further explanation. There needs to be some principle with respect to the humanity of Jesus that accounts for the fullness of his knowledge. At the same time, Christ's human knowledge must really be the word's knowledge in his human mind. To, cre to treat Christ as ignorant of the Father or of his own divine identity in his human mind would seem to flirt with Nestorianism insofar as it might seem to divide the man Jesus, the person acting, from the divine word. According to St. Fulgentius of Ruspe in the early 6th century, accordingly, excuse me, St. Fulgentius of Ruspe in the 6th century emphasized both that Jesus had human knowledge distinct from his divine knowledge and that Jesus' knowledge of the divinity was uniquely full. Here's a quote from him. It's extremely hard and completely foreign to a healthy faith 
to say that the soul of Christ does not have full knowledge of his own deity, end quote. What is more, Fulgentius accounts for how Christ's human mind has the supernatural human knowledge. And he says it's from his full reception of the Holy Spirit. Fulgentius draws extensively on St. Ambrose and St. Augustine to show that Christ receives the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And from this, he concludes that Jesus must have had a full and perfect human knowledge as man. So this is text C on your handout. Quote, the soul of Christ has it in full, has in it full knowledge of the whole divinity. Because the fullness of the whole spirit, totius spiritus, forever remained in him. Fulgentius emphasizes that Christ is the source of the spirit for the whole world. Or as John 1.16 says, from his fullness, we have all received. As such then, Christ must have received in his human soul the fullness of the spirit and thus the fullness of all wisdom and all knowledge, including knowledge of the divine trinity in order to reveal the trinity to the faithful as he gives them a share of his spirit. As we keep moving forward in the middle of the sixth century, Christ's human knowledge emerged again as a key point of dispute, this time over the view of the agnoates. That's from the Greek meaning lack of knowledge. So writing against them, Pope St. Gregory the Great made explicit a key distinction that was already present implicitly in Athanasius, Gregory of Nazianzus, and Cyril of Alexandria. So this is text D from Gregory the Great. Quote, the only begotten son incarnate made perfect man for us, knew the day and the hour of judgment in his human nature, but did not know it from his human nature. What he knew, therefore, in his humanity, he did not know from it, because it is by the power of his divinity that God made man knew the day and the hour of judgment. The God man knows, therefore, the day and the hour of judgment, but precisely because God is man. And Gregory then concludes his argument with a striking statement. It's perfectly clear that whoever is not an historian cannot in any way be an agnoate. For how can one who professes that the wisdom of God himself became incarnate, ever maintain that there is anything that the wisdom of God does not know. That is, if we uh, rephrase this, if you affirm against Nestorius that there's only one person and one subject in Christ, then you will reject the position that Christ's human mind was ignorant. The logic here seems to be that because the human nature of Christ is joined to the divinity in the person of the word, Christ's human mind must be filled with supernatural knowledge derived to it from the word. Now, it doesn't seem that Aquinas knew this text, but St. Gregory here articulates three key points that are very important for Aquinas' account. They become important also for Aquinas, these points. First, the incarnate son is made perfect man for us. That is, he's made perfect for the sake of our salvation. So here again, there's a so-called principle of perfection, but it's not an abstract commitment that Jesus would just be the best at everything. It's a soteriological principle with a long patristic pedigree. Gregory applies it to Christ precisely regarding his human knowledge. Okay, second point. While Christ doesn't know divine things in his humanity from his human mind itself or from its native power, you might say, Christ nevertheless does really know supernatural things like the day of judgment in his human mind. That's the second important principle. You'll, we'll find that also in Aquinas. And third, finally, the ultimate explanation of all of this is that Jesus is wisdom incarnate. The purpose of the incarnation is that, is that the divine word would take up our infirmity into his divine strength, that our ignorance would be dispelled by divine wisdom 
in person. So we can conclude our review of the patristic evidence here with the 7th century Monothelite controversy over whether Christ has one will or two. So part of the case for rejecting this heresy that Christ had only one will was closely connected to the profession of faith that Christ had both a divine and a human intellect and to the claim that Christ as man knew perfectly the divine plan of salvation so that as man he could also will it perfectly. You see the point? If Jesus has two minds, he has two wills, so that as he knows in his human mind God's plan, he wills it perfectly as man. So there's a nice text on this point from Maximus the Confessor, which is text E on your handout, which just for the sake of time, I'm not going to read for you. The Monothelite controversy was was resolved at the Third Council of Constantinople in 680-681. When Thomas Aquinas got his hands on the records of this council, he took note of one of the council's lesser known condemnations of the view that Christ had only a single wisdom pertaining to both his divinity and his humanity. So it's very interesting when Aquinas takes up the issue of Christ's knowledge in the third part, the tertia pars of his Summa Theologiae, Constantinople III makes an early and important appearance. Aquinas cites it to show that the Catholic faith professes that Christ has a true human wisdom distinct from his divine wisdom. The story of Aquinas's discovery of this council and many other patristic sources is the subject for another lecture, but it's actually very interesting. So at this point, let me conclude part one, talking about the church fathers, and turn now to Aquinas's synthesis of the church fathers on this question. So Aquinas's own position on Christ's supernatural human knowledge. Rather than immediately entering into all the details of St. Thomas's arguments in the four questions from the Summa Theologiae that treat this theme, those are uh, Tertia Pars questions nine to 12. If you wanna read more on Aquinas on this theme, that's the best place to go to get all of his doctrine basically in a very concise form. I would like to take a wider view of this issue in Aquinas's theology. Specifically, Aquinas' arguments for Christ's perfect human supernatural knowledge are set within three larger claims or three larger overarching perspectives. First, that Christ is the savior of the world by way of knowledge, that is, as the supreme revealer of God. Second, that Christ is the word incarnate full of grace and truth, who receives the Holy Spirit in full as man. And third, that as an instrument of his divinity, Christ's human nature is perfectly adapted for his saving mission, precisely insofar as it is a rational creature, the humanity of Christ. Now, this third perspective has received more attention than the other, so I'm just going to treat it very briefly at the end. Okay, so let's look at this first claim or overarching perspective. That is, Christ as the supreme revealer, our savior by way of knowledge. It's fundamental for Aquinas that man is made to know, and above all, to know the truth, the truth about God. Quote, the whole salvation of man, Aquinas writes, which is in God, hangs on this knowledge of this truth. He says that at the very beginning of his Summa Theologiae. This capacity to know God, and hence also to love God, is precisely where Aquinas locates the image of God in the human creature. Indeed, in his Summa Contra Gentiles, Aquinas makes the audacious claim that knowledge of divine truth is the ultimate end of the whole universe. And the reason why the word of God, divine truth in person, came into the world in the incarnation. That's text F, which I also, in the interest of time, will we'll skip over. The point is that the knowledge of this truth about God is the end of the whole universe. Now, this might seem surprising since Aquinas famously holds that the incarnation is a remedy for sin. But in fact, Aquinas unites these two perspectives, remedy for sin, perfection of the universe, 
saying that the incarnation is the remedy for the darkness and ignorance that result from sin, and so aims at the ultimate perfection of the universe after the fall. St. Thomas's commentary on John chapter 1, verse 9, uh, which reads, He was the true light which enlightens every man. Aquinas' commentary on this verse spells this out in a striking way, giving three reasons why the word became incarnate. And each reason deals with bringing the human race to a perfect knowledge of God. The first two reasons are especially pertinent to the case that I want to make. So this is text G on your handout. Quote, God willed to become incarnate first because of the perversity of human nature, which from its own malice was darkened by the obscurity of vices and ignorance. God came in the flesh, therefore, so that the darkness could grasp the light that is attain to knowledge of him. There's a parallel passage in the Summa Theologiae where Aquinas explains in further detail that the word's incarnation is fitting as a remedy for the precise nature of the sin of our first parents, the, the darkening of the mind that our first parents' sin caused. This is text H. Quote, For the first man sinned by desiring knowledge, as is clear from the words of the serpent, promising man knowledge of good and evil. Thus, it was fitting that through the word of true wisdom, man, who by an inordinate appetite for knowledge withdrew from God, would be brought back unto God. That is, Aquinas is claiming the word becomes incarnate precisely to bring the light of, divine, of the divine word into the world to heal the disorder in man's mind caused by sin. Okay, let's go back to Aquinas' commentary on John 1, 9, and we'll, we'll find him making the second, offering the second reason for the incarnation of the word. This is your next text on the handout, text I. Second, on account of the insufficiency of prophetic testimony. For the prophets had come, John the Baptist had come, but they were not able to illuminate sufficiently because he was not the light Hence, it was necessary after the prophecies of the prophets, after the coming of John, that the light itself would come and would give the world a knowledge of itself. That is, the light of prophecy wasn't enough to save the world. It's very important, but it's not enough to save the world. The very divine light itself needed to come into the world. As Aquinas explains, Christ acted for our salvation in a way surpassing what someone with only infused prophetic knowledge could do, precisely because a prophet speaks of what he hears, but Christ saw the Father. A prophet has knowledge of God in a dependent way. Christ has full possession, a kind of dominion, over all of the gifts of prophecy. And so as man, Jesus could reveal God in a qualitatively different way than any prophet. Aquinas thinks that a fundamental truth of the gospel is that through the incarnation, the very divine light of God itself is manifested in the world. And his evidence for this is John 1, verses 8 to 9. John the Baptist was not the light but came to bear witness to the light, the true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. Elsewhere, St. Thomas expressly connects this view to the word's assumption of a human mind. This is text J. The purpose of the incarnation is the justification of man from sin, for the human soul is only capable of sin and of justifying grace through the mind. Thus, it was especially necessary for a human mind to be assumed. Hence, Damascene says, the word of God assumed a body and an intellectual and rational soul. And then he adds, the whole was united to the whole so that he would grace me wholly with salvation for what is unassumable is uncurable. St. Thomas's reasoning here clearly echoes St. Gregory of Nazianzus and the quotation that Aquinas uses from John Damascene, is a paraphrase of Gregory. The wound of sin, 
primarily affects man's mind. The remedy of grace is likewise applied through the mind. For this reason, Thomas writes, it was especially necessary for a mind to be assumed. And he continues, the intellect or mind of man is, as it were, a light illuminated by the light of the divine word. Hence, through the light of the divine word, the man of mind is perfected. The Summa Theologiae's treatment of Christ's knowledge is very explicit that in order to accomplish the work of salvation, Christ's human mind needs to be perfect in supernatural knowledge, and especially by the beatific vision. These Summa texts are often read, sometimes by critics of Aquinas, as if Aquinas were motivated primarily by a kind of naive principle of perfection. Jesus just has to be the best in everything. But I hope it's now clear that much more is at stake for Aquinas. Above all, he holds that he holds for Christ's plenary supernatural knowledge because he thinks it's divinely revealed. He thinks it's the only right interpretation of Holy Scripture. But the arguments about perfection are also motivated by other important theological principles that Aquinas holds dear, that Christ's mind needs to be perfectly full of the knowledge of God because we're saved as we come to know God. And after the fall, it was necessary to bring that full and perfect revelation of the knowledge of God to man's mind through the word incarnate present in this world in person. So we confess a plenary knowledge in Christ, including beatific vision and infused knowledge, because Jesus is in no way the beneficiary of revelation, like other prophets are. Rather, he is the agent of revelation. He is the agent of salvation. And this becomes very clear in Aquinas' thought if you read the texts from the Summa Theologiae, which often are very terse, they're very short, uh, concise texts, alongside the much more ample arguments along the same lines that Aquinas offers in other places, like his Compendium of Theology, where he writes, quote, it was fitting that the human nature assumed by the word of God would not be lacking in any perfection, since through it, the whole human nature was to be restored, end quote. And again, from the same source, quote, because we say that Christ is the author of man's salvation, it is necessary to say that Christ's soul had such knowledge as would befit the author of salvation, end quote. On this line, Aquinas uses a provocative analogy, and this is text K on your handout. Among creatures, the man Jesus is like a first mover of salvation by way of knowledge. So here's the quotation. In every genus, that which is the first mover is not moved by the same species of motion as the first mover, or as, as subsequent movers. Now, Christ is established as the head of the church, and indeed of all men, so that all men would not only receive grace through him, but also so that all would receive from him the doctrine of truth. Hence, he himself says, for this I was born, for this I came into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Since Jesus is the highest and first teacher of divine truth, Aquinas' logic uh, goes, Jesus cannot be moved to this knowledge in the same way that other creatures are moved to it. He needs a uniquely full, created knowledge of God precisely in order to be the supreme agent of divine revelation as man and hence of salvation for all creatures, uh, all men and also, for that matter, all angels. And this is how Aquinas reads John chapter 6, verse 46, which goes, no one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. That is, we hear of the Father from the Son, but Jesus as man sees him. Jesus as man becomes the principle of supernatural knowledge of a different and higher order than every other creature. Now this is tied, and, it's, and Aquinas thinks it, it unfolds in a certain way into the claim, that Jesus is the manifestation of the Father's secret inner word. This is text L, a very Johannine idea. Quote, someone manifests his secret 
through his word. And hence, no one can come to a man's secrets except through that man's word. Because, therefore, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God, no one can come to know the Father except through his word, which is his Son. No one knows the Father except the Son, Matthew 11. Just as a man wanting to reveal himself by the word of his heart that he proffers by his mouth clothes that word, as it were, with letters or sounds, so also God, wanting to manifest himself to men, clothes his word conceived from all eternity with flesh in time. And thus no one can come to a knowledge of the Father except through the Son. The humanity of Christ, according to Aquinas then, is related to the Father's word like a spoken word is related to the thought it expresses. As vocal sounds bear within them the meaning of the interior word in the mind so that those sounds reveal that interior word to other people. So also the humanity of Christ is the manifestation in time of the word himself and thus also of the father who speaks him. Now, even this is not a perfect analogy, says Aquinas, because a spoken word is not perfectly identical to the word conceived in the heart. He goes on, quote, whereas the incarnate word is the same as the eternal word, as also the word signified by a voice is the same as the word of the heart. So Christ's teaching surpasses all others, all other teachings in dignity, authority, and usefulness, Aquinas writes, quote, because it was handed on directly by the only begotten Son who is first wisdom, end quote. That is, the man Jesus is the Father's word in the flesh, and he assumes this flesh precisely in order to embody in this world the inner truth from the Father. That means, then, that Christ's revelation is very different, according to Aquinas, than that of a Gnostic teacher who just verbally teaches secrets, secret knowledge, secret divine wisdom in some kind of verbal revelation. Aquinas's point is that the word has become flesh. And so the saving revelation wrought by Christ, built on his beatific vision and his perfect infused knowledge, is accomplished in all of Jesus' actions and sufferings. Jesus, Jesus is the very embodiment of the word of God. And so everything about his life, and indeed his very humanity itself, is both revelatory and salvific. And this is particularly true regarding Christ's passion and death, where we find the greatest manifestation of God's love for us, the highest teaching of wisdom, and also the deeply mysterious revelation of how God responds to evil and suffering. For Aquinas, it's extremely important, in fact, that Jesus have the beatific vision as he suffers on the cross so that he would know on the cross every sinner. He would know every sin so as to take the weight of every sin upon himself. And as he knows in his human mind the terrible burden of sin, knows it perfectly, precisely because in his human mind he has the beatific vision, by which he knows who God is, he also knows what sinners are losing by their sins. And he offers himself to make up for that. Let us now turn, so that's the end of, of the first major reason, that's the, the main point of my talk. Now we're, we're coming towards the end, and I'm going to give you the two final uh, frameworks or perspectives that Aquinas has on Christ's beatific vision, um, that help us see its place in his wider theology. And so the second major point with respect to Aquinas that I want to flag for you, and we'll talk about it for a minute and then we'll conclude with the third reason. The second reason, the second major argument for Christ's supreme supernatural knowledge is that Jesus receives the Holy Spirit in full. And thus, as St. John's prologue says, he is full of grace and tr truth. On this point, Aquinas' reflections have an even more marked Trinitarian dimension than what we've seen so far. And they show 
not only why Jesus needs to have this perfect supernatural knowledge in his human mind, but also how Jesus receives it and how he gives us a saving share in it. And this emerges from Aquinas' synthesis of the church fathers and especially his reading of the councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon. Read together, they teach that Christ is one person with two distinct natures. Aquinas places this anti-Nestorian and anti-Monophysite profession of faith at the heart of his explanation of Christ's beatific vision. And this is text M, which also in the interest of time, I will skip over. But the point is that it's the union in personal being, according to Aquinas, that anchors his claim that knowledge, uh, that Jesus has this, this supreme knowledge. Nonetheless, we cannot say that Jesus has the beatific vision purely and simply because his soul is united to the word by the hypostatic union. And there's a good Chalcedonian reason for that. That union is with respect to being, not with respect to the operation or attributes of Christ's humanity. Another principle besides the hypostatic union is needed to explain the fullness of knowledge in Christ's human mind. And Aquinas' answer to this is, this is Christ's habitual grace. That grace, a grace proper to a human being, supernaturally elevates and perfects his humanity in a human way by a human participation in the divine nature. So this is text N. Christ is true God according to his person and the divine nature. But because with the unity of person, the distinctions of nature's remains, as was shown above, above was an earlier discussion of Chalcedon, the soul of Christ is not divine through its essence. Hence, it must be made divine through participation, which is by grace. Aquinas' point is that the hypostatic union does not itself transform Christ's humanity into a divinized human nature. Rather, it unites that human nature to the word in person while it remains fully and properly human. That's a Chalcedonian point. Aquinas' contention is that it's Christ's habitual grace that is the principle by which his human nature is supernaturally elevated and perfected in a human way. And this habitual grace flows out from the hypostatic union as a necessary consequence, what Aquinas would call a proper accident of the hypostatic union. Quote, like splendor flows from the sun. Now Aquinas offers a Trinitarian reason for this. The divine persons are never separated. When the word is sent into the world visibly in the flesh and begins to exist as man by hypostatic union, the Holy Spirit is sent invisibly to Christ's humanity in which the Holy Spirit dwells not by hypostatic union, but according to Christ's habitual grace. Quote, Christ as man receives grace without measure and therefore he receives the Holy Spirit without measure, Aquinas writes, end quote. So the spirit is present in the soul, in person, according to the gift of supernatural charity, which is always given with habitual grace. And that means that wherever grace is present, that, that wherever this habitual grace is present, we can be sure that the Holy Spirit is there in person. On this point, Aquinas quotes the Glossa Ordinaria, Christ receives totum spiritum, the whole spirit, the Holy Spirit in his entirety. Quote, God gives the spirit to men by measure, but to the son without measure. He gives his entire spirit, totum spiritum suum, to the incarnate son, not in a particular fashion, nor by subdivision, but universally and generally. In fact, if you've been paying attention, you should notice a strong resemblance to the argument of St. Fulgentius of Ruspe, which we discussed earlier. It's a remarkable resemblance. I wonder if St. Fulgentius is not the unnamed source of this quotation in the, for the Glossa Ordinaria. In any case, like St. Fulgentius, 
St. Thomas argues that if Jesus has the Spirit in full, that is, without measure, then his mind must be filled with the highest supernatural knowledge possible to a human intellect, including both the beatific vision and a supreme infused knowledge. Quote, because Christ has the Spirit without measure, it belongs to him to know all things in the word, end quote. That's, again, St. Thomas. And Aquinas says in the Summa Theologiae, quote, just as Christ had the fullness of sanctifying grace at the first moment of his conception, so also he had the fullness of knowledge of the truth. As John 1.14 says, we saw his glory full of grace and truth, end quote. In fact, this is Aquinas' ultimate explanation for how Jesus has that supreme supernatural knowledge. He has the light given by the Holy Spirit in his human mind. By way of conclusion, uh, let me make a few final remarks about the third overarching argument that Aquinas gives for Christ's supernatural human knowledge. This has been well treated by other authors, and so I'm just going to summarize uh, Aquinas' view. For Aquinas, Jesus needs this supreme human knowledge if he's to be the perfect human instrument of the divine word. So, this is the analogy that Aquinas uses. When a king selects a servant for an important mission, he doesn't choose one that is ignorant of his purposes or one with a divided heart. The king wants an, a minister who will understand perfectly what the king is trying to do. Likewise, the divine word assumes a human nature with an intellect endowed with a perfect knowledge of God and of God's plan of salvation and with a will perfectly conformed to God and to God's plan. That doesn't mean that the mind of Jesus is like that of some kind of sci-fi space alien or some infinite supercomputer with data on every fact. Aquinas' idea is that Christ's beatific vision gives him a simple knowledge of what is supremely intelligible, the divine essence. And Aquinas draws an analogy to a very intelligent person who's given to know a core principle. So you might think of like what, when you're learning proofs in geometry class or something like that. People with lesser intellectual not lights need all of the consequences of the principle to be explained to them one by one. But someone with a more powerful mind, a more powerful intellectual light, understands all at once all of the consequences that flow from the principle. Once you get the principle, you can work out all the consequences. And in fact, someone with a stronger intellectual light does not have to work out laboriously the answer to the further questions. He immediately gets it because he understands the principle so deeply. On Aquinas' account, Christ's mind is like this as it sees the divine essence. Jesus as man sees all things that he himself, the divine word, has done and will do as God. And of course, God's causality extends to all things that will be. So Christ's human knowledge also grasps this, but not like an infinite collection of facts. He grasps it in one grasp. I hope it's now clear that Christ's plenary supernatural human knowledge is not a minor detail in Aquinas' Christology or for the church fathers. In fact, for the church fathers who are the source of Aquinas' view, the place of Christ's human knowledge is very important for their global account of the Christian faith. From Aquinas' perspective, at least, if you deny that Jesus had this knowledge as man, you're not just tweaking your Christology or removing something inessential from it. You're, in fact, pulling out a central pillar of the whole account. So if you're going to articulate a Christology that doesn't include a full supernatural knowledge 
in Jesus' human mind, from Aquinas' view at least, you're going to need to come up with a very different account of the economy of salvation and the purpose of the incarnation. That very different view is not the one that Aquinas, and I think many of the church fathers had in mind, they believe that Christ as man is the perfect human embodiment, including in his human mind, of the divine word of the Father. And so Jesus rightly says of the Father, I know him, for I come from him and he sent me. Thank you. Um, my question is, if Christ you know, beholds the beatific vision and has this divine knowledge, um, is there any room for you know, importing anything as a, in, in his humanity, or does he have simply all knowledge to the very beginning? Yeah, that's a good question, and it's one that are, that St. Thomas explicitly deals with. Uh, so I could have included. If we, had a, if we had more time, we could, we could go into the other categories of Christ's knowledge. So there were three, right? His beatific vision, by which, according to Aquinas, he sees the essence of God. Infused prophetic knowledge. This is knowledge like the prophets have. Uh, so it's not seeing God's essence, but it's receiving some kind of strengthened uh, intellectual light. And then experiential human knowledge. That's the average, everyday human knowledge that you and I have, which we get through our senses. So interestingly, in among the medievals, Aquinas was the first to put forward that third category of knowledge. So others had theories of, of I mean, all the medievals held for very high supernatural knowledge of Jesus. They didn't have a place for his experiential human knowledge. It's Aquinas who, who puts that in and says, actually, this is really important to affirm also that Jesus really does learn things through his senses. Now, he doesn't learn things uh, that he doesn't already know in some sense. So that would be uh, the difference, that uh, we discover truths about the world uh, through our senses. And, uh, and Aquinas would hold that Jesus also, in a certain way, learns them in a human way through his senses. But he's not surprised by what he discovers, as it were. But it's probably important to reserve a certain... Um, a certain reticence to, to try and go too far in accounting for what, how Jesus' mind worked. Um, so Aquinas wants to say, well, he had to have this knowledge of the Father if he's going to be the perfect revealer. And that must mean that he sees all things in the light of God. He's able to understand perfectly God's plan. He's able to configure his will perfectly to God's plan of salvation. And that if he didn't have the beatific vision, he wouldn't be able to do those things, and so he wouldn't be able to be the kind of savior we need but does it mean that, um, you know, how do we, how do we uh, break all that down in terms of, of what Jesus would have, would have known or, or how he would have had these concepts in his mind? I think it's probably better to have a certain reserve about how far we, we go with that. So according to these three categories of knowledge, how much can we say about the notion of the Christ, especially since he possesses some of the vision and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and this knowledge by means of um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Is there any space for us to say that the man in the moment before time in Christ's life and consolation uh, would have been taken away from him? Or if Christ went through something like a dark night with the city of mystics, what exactly is the space for us to say that Christ had um, these simple encounters of his spiritual life that aren't necessarily removing knowledge for Christ's man? but Jesus' experience of those. Yeah. yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, so Aquinas also has a very robust account of the passions of Christ's soul. That's what he calls them. In fact, technically, Aquinas says, yeah, we have passions, and he calls them in Jesus pro-passions because, they, because of the fall, our passions are unruly. We experience them uh, surging up, kind of unwelcome. Um, or without the guidance of reason. And then our mind has to like try and, you know, put it, rein them in and order them in the right way. And sometimes this big part of fallen human nature is we, we find that difficult. Um, Jesus didn't have that problem because he was without sin. 
So experience in his humanity, no effects of sin. So he does have passions. Now, passions are not bad, according to Aquinas. The passions are good. They're a good part of the human creature, which God created to be there. God wants them, wants us to have passions. They help get us moving. They help get us going. They, uh, they have a bodily element, uh, but they can affect, you know, how our mind works. They can affect how we uh, move from, you know, from rest to activity. So when, when you get angry about something, it's, it's prompting you to respond to an injustice. So Jesus becomes angry uh, at the, in the temple when he, when he drives out the money changers. And this is, it's right for him to do that. It's right for him to respond with anger according to the measure of reason. But according to Aquinas, Christ's passions always move, uh, as it were, subsequent to the judgment of reason, not, not before the judgment of reason. So they're all always in accord with reason. So Jesus is always perfectly measured in his anger. He never lets it get out of control. So it's very important when we then talk about the passion of Christ. Okay, that's actually, you know, a technical, Aquinas uses that term, and it's related to the passions. Passion is the undergoing. Jesus is suffering on the cross. How does it happen that Jesus is able to suffer uh, on the cross? Does he experience a dark night of the soul in the Garden of Gethsemane, for example? Um, Aquinas would not say that Jesus ever experiences a darkening of his intellect. Uh, so the dark night of the soul is often associated with like um, the obscurity of faith. You know, the mind does not see, but we simply cling to God's promises. Uh, but Jesus did not have faith, according to Aquinas. Jesus had vision. And we could get into this more. It's implicit in, in the argument that I was trying to make. It's important to say that Jesus had vision and not faith because he's the foundation of our faith. So someone has to see. Uh, and it's Jesus who sees and tells us, and we trust that. So we have faith. Jesus doesn't have faith. Um, if, if Jesus has faith, then we're, we're, we got to come up with a new, a new theory. Um, so Jesus, even on the cross, does not cease to have the beatific vision. And Aquinas actually has a, an express treatment of this and says, well, how is it possible for him to suffer like in his soul? If he has, is he just suffering in his body? And he says, no, he's suffering in his soul. He, uh, by a kind of miracle, as it were, segments off the, the highest vision and so that it doesn't overflow into the rest of his soul so that he's able to fully experience our loss according to sin. But, uh, and Aquinas is not super explicit on the second point, which I'm about to say, but this is my, my reading of him, which I alluded to in the paper, uh, is that it's important for Jesus to have the beatific vision precisely at the cross, because uh, how is he sufficiently sorrowing for the sin of the whole world? Our sins tend to plunge us more and more into darkness and ignorance. So the more someone sins, the more numb they get to the gravity of the evil they are committing. So if you've been sinning for a long time, you cease to even think it's a big deal. Who understands the real gravity of sin? Well, the saint, but actually ultimately, above all, someone with the beatific vision, who is able to see precisely how bad the sin is. Like you have to see how good God is and understand how terrible it is to lose him before you're able to really grasp the terribleness of sin. This is precisely what happens with Jesus at, at the cross. So he, he sees all of the sin of the world. He sees the tremendous loss that all of us incur. And because he loves us, and love makes one regard the beloved as another self, he regards that loss as his. So this is his taking on our loss. And he needs the beatific vision in order to do it. But because he has the beatific vision, he is able to love us perfectly, even as we experience this, you know, the, the, the trauma of sin. And, and so that's what he's doing on the cross. He's willing to offer everything he has to save us, seeing what we are losing. 
Um, thank you so much, Father John, man. That was fantastic. Um, you mentioned the kind of controversy surrounding Christ's apparent profession of ignorance about the Day of Judgment in Scripture. Um, and the explanation that I had always entertained uh, you know, to kind of resolve that, um, you said it didn't work well. So I had always thought that it was, he was speaking of his human intellect, his human intellect, didn't know the Day of Judgment, and his God had obviously his position. Um, but then you said that he receives through the, you know, the action of, of the Holy Spirit in his fullness, uh, you know, supernatural knowledge, including the knowledge of the Day of Judgment. So I guess, like, how do we interpret that passage then? Like, what kind of ignorance is he speaking of? Is he speaking of, like, how his human intellect would have reacted to that if he didn't have the theistic vision and other forms of no, that's not the way Aquinas goes with it, nor really uh, the church fathers that, I, that I've that i studied on this. Now, I'm not a super expert on, on um, the patristic debates over this, uh, but I have tried to have tried to learn something about it. Um, it was important in the controversy with Arius. Um, so Athanasius talks about this. Arians, or uh, people at least that Athanasius labels as Arians, uh, put forward these claims about the ignorance of Christ of the Day of Judgment to suggest that maybe his, his uh, you know, he's not as fully divine, or at least that's the way Athanasius frames their position. Um, and uh, so there, th this, is, this is a serious issue, um, I think, in the patristic period that people, that people are debating. The, the text that we looked at, I think it was from uh, Gregory, is that it's not a knowledge that he has from his human mind, but he has it in his human mind. And I think that's a very important distinction, which, if I'm not mistaken, is already in Athanasius. Um, I'll get to the question of the, how to interpret that passage of scripture, but just to, I think it's an important distinction to, to keep in mind. We can say that as man, he knows it, but he knows it as it were, as it were, as if it were given to him from above. That's consistent with Aquinas' view that Jesus is receiving, say, the, the fullness of the Holy Spirit as man, and so that's what's illuminating his human mind. It's not that from his human nature, he's able to know the day of judgment. That's unknowable to a human being from, a human, from the powers of human nature. Whereas knowledge of physics or something like that is knowable to us by the powers of our nature. But this is specifically supernatural knowledge which had to be given to him from above. Uh, then how do we interpret that passage? I think Aquinas and other church fathers would say, um, there, there are varying interpretations, but the one that I'm most familiar with would be to say, Jesus is not, he's speaking about what he is, is appropriate for him to reveal. So when he says that it's, that he doesn't know, it means that it's not for you to know. And so I am not revealing it, um, but not that absolutely speaking, he didn't know. But there are a number of other scripture passages like that, where, you know, you have, passages that, that are gonna require some careful interpretation to make them kind of jive with other, other difficult passages. Hey, Father, um, hello. Uh, thank you for your talk. I was wondering your thoughts about this um, controversial scene in the series The Chosen, where Jesus is practicing and struggling to formulate his speech for the servant on the mouth. Would, would, does that make sense for him to do that? Or would, what would Aquinas or Father say about that? Would he, you know, since it's sort of fine, I'll be able to sort of have that ready? Or would he, as a human, sort of struggle to formulate it and, uh, you know, have to work at it for the speech to work? Yeah, that's, that's a, uh, an interesting question. I've not watched the series. Um, so I haven't thought about this before, but I think Aquinas would suggest that Jesus wouldn't have a difficult time formulating, you know, the right doctrine. So he would, he would be able to say it perfectly and, and well. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the short answer. So I don't think he would have difficulty. What, what's involved there? I mean, could we imagine um, Jesus being like, ah, yeah, I didn't really get that right, you know, or I didn't say that right, the right way. I wish I could take those words back and say it again. Human, you know, human teachers, that happens to us all the time. Or you might just stumble over your words. Um, you know, you might say, uh, well, in fact, Aquinas um, did 
write in one of his manuscripts. I was talking with uh, one of the editors of the Leonine edition texts. These are the critical editions of Aquinas' texts. He was saying, you know, Aquinas writes so fast that sometimes he, he makes mistakes and he doesn't notice it. And so in one text, he says, therefore, God does not exist. It's like, oh, well, clearly Aquinas did not really think that God did not exist. He, so the editors want to delete that word, right? They want to delete the not there. They put a little footnote in there saying, well, the text actually says God did not exist, but we, we were sure that. So Aquinas, sometimes Homer nods, so does Aquinas. Did Jesus, did Jesus, well, he fell asleep. Um, he didn't get sick. He permitted himself to be killed, but he seems to have died in a rather extraordinary way. So he did not, he says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. There seems to be something miraculous about the way he, the way he laid down his life, as it were, by, as it were, by an act of will. And I think that would all maybe be evidence that Jesus dominion over his own, like his own bodily actions is somehow more full than ours so that he can apportion the gifts of the spirit. And this is something that Aquinas says very explicitly that where other prophets wait for the spirit to come and they say, uh, the spirit says this, or the spirit gave me to, you know, the spirit came to me and I, and, and so I say to you, or the word, they say the word of the Lord, you know, says, uh, Jesus never says that because he has a kind of plenary dominion over the gifts of the spirit. He possesses the spirit in full. So he is the dispenser, not the recipient. And that would suggest that then he's able to very, without difficulty, find the perfect word to say. I think very much about that.